The Groiper phenomenon of late October 2019 presents us with an interesting analytical opportunity from a mold buggyian perspective. For those unfamiliar with this, I will try to give as fast a crash course as I can. A Groiper is a meme frog that is an alteration of the classic Pepe. Groipers are a common avatar for young right-wing dissidents in a similar way as Pepe was in 2016. People of this mindset not only use Groipers as avatars, but also refer to each other as Groipers, similar to how one could be a Pepe during the Trump campaign. In October, some of these people began asking uncomfortable questions at events put on by agents of the Republican Party, which we know as the Outer Party. These questions covered a variety of topics, but the common threads among them were Christian values and demographic change in the United States. When a groiper asks one of these questions, it is known as groiping. The particular style of groiping, which is a serious but humorous style, comes mainly from the conservative nightly broadcast America First by Nicholas J. Fuentes. At one particular event at Ohio State University in late October, the gatekeeper fake conservative Charlie Kirk was groiped very successfully live on air, which caused an explosion of new energy on the right, along with successive groipings on an almost daily basis from then on. Some commentators have compared this phenomenon to others in 2016, such as Magapedes, Kekistan, and the Trump campaign generally. However, astute observers may notice some key differences that are interesting from a neo-reactionary point of view. The main difference I notice is the role of the outer party. By its very nature as a Republican presidential campaign, the Trump movement was essentially bounded by the frame of the outer party, and it is an excellent example of the Fabian strategy in action. Moldbug defines the Fabian strategy by saying, quote, Fabian incrementalism means supporting either the outer party or a minor party, such as the libertarians. By definition, if you are going to take power using the democratic process, you have to support some party or other, end quote. Obviously, President Trump used these exact means in order to take power. Since the Outer Party is a defense mechanism of the cathedral, from this we would predict that Trump would be captured and neutralized by it. One of the major traps he has fallen into is allying with progressives, and adopting progressive principles for convenience. We know that elected politicians are the nominal but not actual wielders of power in the United States. So being an elected politician is insufficient in opposing real power. Third, Trump has demonstrated clearly that he falls into the class of politicians that does not oppose the cathedral unequivocally, but only on single issues. The America First movement differs from this significantly. First, the democratic process and outer party is not the means by which the Groipers are aiming to achieve political ends. The Groipers are not using the outer party as a vehicle, like Trump, but rather they are targeting the non-democratic supporting institutions around the outer party and some outer party politicians themselves. In particular, Turning Point USA proved to be an excellent target due to the incongruence of its attempt to influence young people and what the young people actually wanted to hear. Second, the idea of America First is founded on firm, uncompromising principles, unlike the malleable deal-making strategy of President Trump. The ideas are prefaced on uncompromising Catholic and nationalist principles, as exemplified by the persistent and consistent questioning by the Groipers. Third, America First is in opposition to the cathedral unequivocally. The Groipers pretend no particular allegiance to the Outer Party over any other part of the cathedral. They recognize the Outer Party as a containment mechanism, and are in fact prioritizing attacking it over any other part of the cathedral because of this. While the America First ideas have been protected by a vanguard for quite some time, the actualization of these principles into American social life as a semi-organized movement is only in its infancy. It is difficult to overstate another key difference here between what is happening now and what happened in 2015 and 2016. In 2015 and 2016, the right was inextricably linked to Donald Trump due to the nature of it being centered around him and his campaign. The relationship was symbiotic, with his campaign injecting vast quantities of energy into the right, and the right in turn providing populist support for his campaign. In 2019 and in 2020, the field is very different around the Groipers. The dissident right has bootstrapped itself into its own self-sustaining community. It is multipolar and not organized around a single person. Even the Groipers are not organized around Nick Fuentes in the same way people were organized around Donald Trump. Trump supporters emerged as a direct response to Donald Trump. Groipers emerged organically as a phenomenon of right-wing culture itself. Donald Trump was the primary source of action in 2016, with the populist right following him. 
but with little direct interaction between him and his fan base. In 2019, although Nick Fuentes acted as a figurehead who provided ideas and took some action himself, during many critical moments he was not an actor but an observer. This is the inverse of the relationship in the Trump campaign. Groypers were the primary source of action in 2019. Were Trump to suddenly end his campaign, the populist movement would have faltered tremendously and almost instantly. If Nick Fuentes were to suddenly end his show, the right would continue on, and likely Groypers would continue on as well. One way that we can know this is by observing that although Nick Fuentes proclaimed on his show an end to this phase of the Groyper war and disavowed association with future activity, people are still trying to do it. Next, we can note the importance of aesthetics among the Groypers. From one of Mencius Moldbug's new essays, we read, quote, All revolutions begin as a fundamentally aesthetic break. The first step in a cultural revolution is the birth of a new artistic school. Behind this aesthetic must come an artistic movement, then artistic institutions. These institutions, if they prosper, become the cultural core of the new regime. Art is the spring, lever, and hinge of any real change in our time, end quote. It is difficult to emphasize enough the importance of aesthetics in the propagation of an idea. In the parlance of the Groypers, they understand the importance of optics. Something is optical if it is aesthetically positive. An optics check is a call to analyze whether or not something is optical. Usually, an optics check is asked for in a tongue-in-cheek manner on something that is obviously not optical. Something that is not optical is cringe. Most groups have some sort of language around aesthetics. Progressives and women might say that something unesthetic is not a good look. I believe that the Groypers are, or at least may be closer to, a fundamentally aesthetic break with the cathedral. The MAGA movement inherited its aesthetic from over-the-top American patriotism, which was handed to it by Donald Trump through previous incarnations, and was thus completely unoriginal but it also began the process of developing a new aesthetic by adopting Pepe. However, Pepe was tightly coupled with MAGA, and did not live on its own. The Groypers are combining, well, Groypers, with a traditionalist Christian and masculine aesthetic. This aesthetic is not tied to any particular person or campaign slogan, such as Make America Great Again, and builds from the previous aesthetic, but stands on its own. Finally, we can examine the narrative of the Groypers, and how it might succeed, or not succeed, against the Cathedral. Here, the uncertainty is greatest, as success requires the navigation of shifting ground. The first principles of a movement can be set in stone by its founders, and the aesthetics of the movement are more organic and in competition with other aesthetics. But once demonstrating a certain level of excellence, they essentially self-propagate mimetically. The narrative, on the other hand, remains in constant dialogue with other narratives. The narrative is not to be mistaken for the strategy. The strategy of the Groypers, as I stated earlier, is a complete break with the cathedral and the outer party on the terms of Christian morality. This touches mostly on the side of the narrative that is the negation of the current order. As followers of radical traditionalists such as Evola know, a traditional reaction against modernity is not merely a negation, but must also entail a positive vision. Assuming that such a narrative exists, and I'll leave it to the viewer to make this determination, what are the meta-conditions for success? As Moldbug describes, we currently live in a two-story state. The two-story state is stabilized by an Overton bubble that contains a marketplace of ideas. Free thought and speech occur within this bubble, as long as the stories in it remain convincing. When this is no longer the case, stories outside of the bubble emerge, and stability can be threatened. Sustained elite ineptitude results in the stories no longer being convincing. The elites are failing to sustain both stories in the Overton bubble, liberalism and conservatism, and as a result, many stories once thought impossible are emerging. For his analysis of stories, Moldbug divides the political core of society into three layers. Quote, As Orwell wrote, all societies have three human layers. We may call ours gentry, commoners, and clients. The gentry are urbanites, cultivated and ambitious. The commoners are suburbanites, educated and independent. The clients are Marx's proletariat and lumpen proletariat, uneducated and or dependent. End quote. Not all stories outside of the Overton bubble are inherently dangerous. Some competing stories have already failed spectacularly, such as those of the alt-right. As Moldbug writes, quote, The most dangerous outside stories, A, are completely true, B, aim at rogue gentry, and C, exalt commoners and or disparage clients. Any such narrative might be the political formula for the next regime. End quote. Moldbug demonstrates the understanding that elite revolts are the most common type of successful revolution. 
A story that aims at rogue elites is very dangerous. The elites are the gentry in Moldbug's model. There are some rogue elites who are noticing a third story. Tucker Carlson is the favorite example at the moment, an elite who recognizes that the story of the left and the story of what is allegedly the right both appear to be false. Truth makes a story dangerous, and the alternative story that Tucker offers shares some qualities with the story of the Groypers, which espouses nationalism and Christian morality. These stories say that a country is better served by putting its own interests first, and a people is better served by having a Christian love for each other. The third component of Moldbug's dangerousness criteria is that the story exalts commoners and or disparages clients. The general narrative of the dissident right of the past few years has tended to do this. Commoners have been exalted over the elites for quite some time. The elites produce fake news, and we commoners produce spicy takes. As for the clients, there may be disparagement, depending on how one looks at it. Although Moldbug includes urbanites in the gentry, one might recognize the bugmen type of urbanite as belonging to the client vote bank, and these types are lampooned relentlessly by the dissident right. We seem to have the basic ingredients and conditions for a third story to emerge in our two-story regime, and become dangerous. How can we measure whether or not a third story is doing so? As the America First narrative flows through culture, the key sign of success will be whether or not more elites are drawn into it, in particular if these elites are a breakaway faction from conservatism. As Moldbug has said in the past, quote, If the Republicans could somehow dissolve themselves permanently and irrevocably, it would be the most brutal blow ever struck against the Democrats, end quote. In the terms of his newest writing, the dissolution of the Republican Party is part of the process of merging the two-story state into a one-story state. While it is somewhat counterintuitive that the Republican Party must be eliminated as a political force distinct from the Democrats, this idea is actually baked right into the Groyper's third-story narrative. The right is recognizing that conservatives are progressives driving the speed limit. They are fundamentally the same, and we must therefore truly make them the same. We must stop allowing the Republicans to pretend that they have a different story than the Democrats. We can already see the two-story poles moving towards convergence, and at the point of convergence, the civic core will be exposed to having the power of the political core exerted on it. At this moment, the state could resort to hard oppression, a common strategy in a one-story state, or a third story could become the formula for the next regime. There is already a multitude of such stories available, and the critical factor for which could achieve victory is whether or not they have the correct rogue elites on their side. Therefore, we should pay attention in 2020 to whether or not more elites are attracted to America First, and which ones they are. If the America First movement is very successful, it will achieve electoral significance this year by having the right elites on its side. The MAGA movement was based on populism and the masked man, and America First is based on elitism. To the extent that America First becomes more elite, it will be more successful than MAGA. Groypers must cultivate and remain loyal to their elites, be those elites Nick Fuentes or others. The Groypers even have a language for this, known as trusting the plan. Trust the plan means to follow even when you don't understand. The fact that some Groypers understand this is a promising sign. Finally, we can address the comparisons made to Kekistan. Some have called the Groypers Kekistan 2.0, but this is merely a superficial comparison that is easily rebutted. Kekistan was leaderless and can't even be considered a movement, as it had no agenda or purpose beyond merely trolling. Groypers use iconography similar to that of Kekistan, but all similarities end there. If you try to apply my analysis of the Groypers to Kekistan, you'll find that it simply does not map onto it because there is no substance to Kekistan whatsoever. With that, I will leave it to you to decide whether or not you are more optimistic about America first. To me, success is not guaranteed, but the Groypers are configured in a way that makes them more likely to succeed than previous right-wing attempts at taking power in the last few years. Thanks for watching.